Hi everyone, this is uh, John. Today I'm presenting uh, Over the Board Game. I actually played this game uh, last night at my local chess club. So uh, let me say a few words setting up the uh, game. This is a five round tournament. This is the game from the fourth round. Uh, to start off the tournament, I actually had a bad start. I started off with two losses. Um, usually uh, I get paired up in this uh, chess club in the first round, meaning I face a higher rated player in the first round. Um, but uh, if I lose that game, then usually I get to play someone somewhat lower rated on the second round. But I had uh, uh, the bad luck in this tournament where in the first round one of the top players uh, lost unexpectedly and I got paired against him in the second round. So I had two uh, very high rated players in a row, lost both games. And then the third round, I finally got to face a lower rated player. And uh, I did manage to win that one, but it was a very unconvincing victory. I actually was probably uh, losing through most of the game, and then my opponent uh, was just playing too quickly uh, and uh, overlooked a skewer and lost a piece. So uh, anyway, I managed to win that one, so I was one point out of three at the start of this round. And uh, once again, facing a lower-rated player, and I really need to uh, win this game just to, uh, just to maintain my rating. So I am uh, out for a win. Uh, let's see, to talk about the ratings, uh, my tournament rating, meaning the uh, rating on which the pairings are based, was uh, 1826, and that's based on the most recent published rating. Um, since that was published, actually, a couple of tournaments I played in were rated, and my current live rating is uh, 1884, so somewhat higher than the published rating. And uh, my opponent, in the reverse situation, his published rating was 1750, and his live rating was 1732. So there's a significant... Um, rating advantage in my favor, um, but of course the rating doesn't determine the outcome of the game, only the moves played. Um, and uh, also I was somewhat tired. This is, uh, affects the way I play. Uh, I hadn't gotten uh, a good night's sleep the night before, so I was coming in uh, not wanting to play anything too, uh, too exotic uh, or confusing. Um, so it resulted in an interesting game, I thought, where um, so d4, d5, c4, the queen's gambit, and my opponent played e6, Queen's Gambit declined. Um, so what I was going to say about this game in general is it had a very nice uh, positional character, and that's why I kind of wanted to present it. I get asked uh, <clears throat> every now and then, uh, you know, why I don't do more positional type commentary uh, in my videos, and partly it's because I don't feel all that qualified. And um, but secondly, uh, um, it's it's. Uh, you know, positional ideas are easy to explain sometimes, but hard to implement. Um, on the surface of what appears to be a smooth positional game, underneath the surface of what appears to be a smooth positional game, is sometimes a, a very complex array of tactics. And the, these uh, these uh, players, these classical players that can play these positional uh, <clears throat> type of games and, and have these smooth victories, it's usually because they're, they're very tactically sharp. And usually what happens in my game is uh, one side or the other makes a, a mistake and then the game kind of explodes into tactics. But uh, this, this game maintains a, a positional character for a long time, and I thought uh, uh, some of you might find it interesting. So uh, knight c3, the most common move here in knight f6, is a very standard, well-trodden line. Um, and of course, uh, bishop g5 is a well-known line here. Also, uh, knight knight f3, very respectable. And bishop e7. Um, black also could play c6 there and set up a semi-slot, but this is a fine way to play. And now the most common moves here are to develop the bishop either to g5 or to f4. Good, good squares for the bishop. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, I was somewhat tired, and I don't normally play that way. My most common move here is e3, which is a playable move. Um, it's not uh, really a try for an advantage. It's more of a try for uh, keeping the game going and not, uh, not getting lost in some uh, tactical complications. Um, so the engine rates this position about even, for example. Um, but it's a position, I play this structure a lot uh, against the semi-slav, against the Nimzo Indian. It's a position I'm familiar with. And, uh, you know, if I had been a little more alert and awake, I probably would have played one of those bishop moves instead because I've been trying to, uh, you know, expand my repertoire a little bit and get away from my common patterns. But uh, being a little bit tired, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm more inclined in this game to just play uh, the standard stuff that I'm used to. Okay, so my opponent castles here, um, and these are all uh, good moves. Uh, but right here, a bit of an unusual choice. 
Um, there's lots of different ways to play this. Uh, probably c6, knight bd7 is, is the way I would play it. That's the most uh, solid way. Um, you can also take here. Um, that's another way to play it. Since I've already moved my bishop, you know, I have to lose a tempo to recapture. But my opponent plays uh, c5 here. And so this is, uh, you know, directly challenging my center, setting up the symmetrical formation, and it's just inviting a number of different uh, possible transformations. So uh, I would call this position a semi Um but actually when I uh, looked up the game afterwards, it got classified as a Teresh, probably because of what happened in the next few moves. So um, I took this way, expecting him to take back with the knight, and uh, knight takes is the most common move here. Um, so let's just show what would have happened. And then I would play here, and then he would um, take. And I take back. And this is a typical kind of position you might get from the semi uh White can further exchange, black. Black can further exchange here. And what happens is that uh, white has a majority of the pawns on the king side. Uh, Black has this uh, two against one majority on the queen side and, and could look forward to an end game advantage, but in the middle game, um, you know, white has a strong central presence. So that's a decent way to play. A playable for black as well. And that would have been uh, a semi Um What my opponent played, I took here, and he took back with the pawn. And now the, uh, the game takes on a different flavor. Um, I decide at this point to give my opponent an isolated queen's pawn and play against that. And uh, this sort of idea appeals to me, uh, particularly in this situation, because it's uh, just kind of a, a simple plan. <laughs> so I'm not going to be doing any uh, overly fancy or complicated uh, thinking here. There's just kind of one theme that runs through the whole game, which is play against the isolated queen's pawn. And this kind of position is uh, can arise from the Tarash defense, and so that's probably why it... Um, got called a Tarash. Although when I play against the Tarash in the standard lines, usually what has happened is I played uh, g3 and Fianchetto my bishop to g2 and I'm getting pressure along this diagonal against the uh, the isolated queen's pawn. So, uh, so even though this is a, a familiar kind of position, I don't know if I've ever been exactly in this position before and, uh, and I don't have my bishop in the ideal spot to combat the isolated queen's pawn of the Tarash. So, so I have to, uh, you know, innovate. I'm not, I'm not playing by rote at this point. I'm thinking about my moves. Um, and, uh, and I think it's interesting to watch the, the battle against the isolated queen's pawn unfold from this point forward. So I castle. And uh, every move, before I make it, I have to calculate what's going to happen if uh, black advances the pawn. Because the, the key thing here is the isolated queen's pawn is a temporary advantage for black. It gives him a little more space in the center. It gives him easy development for his pieces. Uh, but in the long run, it's a uh, weakness. And um, as long as I have this pawn on e3, it prevents his d pawn from becoming a passed pawn. If this pawn were isolated but passed, it would be a strength in the end game. But as it is, it's a weakness in the end game. It can become a target, it has no pawns on either side to defend it. And uh, so that's what this game is going to be about in this stage, is uh, is that pawn a weakness or a strength? And the advantage that black has in development can make this a strength, uh, and a lot of times that's realized by pushing the pawn forward and just opening things up, even uh, sometimes in, in at the expense of sacking the pawn. So here, um, if he pushes the pawn, I can just take it. Um, so this would go, um, this is a common trick, just put it on the board, he takes, I take, he takes, he takes, and then check, <laughs> and he loses the queen. So it's defended tactically, um, so I don't have to worry about him pushing the pawn at this point, but it, uh, it illustrates the character of this game, which is that uh, on the surface, it may look like a, a, just a positional play, but underneath, <laughs> there's all these tactics that you have to compute on every move. And I think, actually, that's what makes positional play hard. It's not the positional ideas that are difficult. It's, it's how you realize them. <laughs> so, um, anyway, going back to the game. Uh, my opponent played bishop to g4 here, pinning my knight and continuing his development. 
and uh, once again I have to consider whether he can um, play the move uh, E uh, D4 here rather and also if he's going to get some pressure against my uh, pinned knight. So the exchange here, if I don't want to mess up my pawns, is going to pull my queen away from the d-file. So eventually I decide just to drop my bishop back to e2, and, and once again um, this uh, pawn push doesn't work. Um, and the reason it doesn't work now is for a different reason. If he pushes, um, uh, I can take and uh, it's adequately defended and if he tries to eliminate one of the defenders I can just take back here. Now he can grab the pawn but he loses the rook in the corner. So the exchange brings my bishop to a good square and gives it some counter tactics. So once again uh, this pawn cannot be pushed. <laughs> and, uh, but that's what I mean about the, the calculations under the surface. Every move I make I have to run this calculation. What happens if he pushes that pawn and what kind of defense do I have? My opponent plays knight c6, and here is uh, another spot where I, I thought for a long time. Um, one idea I have, and, and it's probably okay, so just to play my knight here and bring it back and just blockade that pawn. Um, blockading the pawn uh, is a way to uh, prevent it, just mechanically, from going forward. And uh, then, having blockaded it, what you want to do is somehow arrange an exchange so you get rid of all the other pieces on the board and then uh, play against that pawn in the end game. Um, so that's one way to play this position. Um, let's see, is there a problem? I ended up not playing this. I'm not sure if there's a tactical problem with this. Say if he just kicks it and I drop here. Um, he can just continue developing. So I guess there's no real uh, tactical problem at this point, but it's not maybe the best way to play. The engine rates this as uh, favorable to black actually. Um, one problem is that uh, check the development. So I've been I've been making moves here um, and uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and put on the move I decided to play. I decided to play b3 so that I would have good development for this bishop. Until I move the b pawn um, the bishop's only avenue of development is this direction and that will block the queen uh, from looking at the, uh, the d file and the d pawn and so I don't really want to do that so um, I, I play the move b3. So now let's let's talk about development. Um, my opponent has four pieces developed and I only have three and it's his turn to move. So he's basically gained um, two, two steps in development over me. And um, it's because I've made a bunch of pawn moves basically. Part of them were necessary in order to create this isolated queen's pawn which I think is going to be a long-term weakness. But, uh, <clears throat> but I have to survive, uh, I have to recognize the the uh, advantage my opponent has in development and make sure that I'm very careful and I'm not uh, I'm not uh, <clears throat> falling further behind in development and there's not an opportunity for him to take advantage of this uh, development or this lack of development and push the pawn. So um, after b3 uh, once again it's still not safe for him to um, push the pawn. Well it's not the best move here. Um, I can throw in knight a4 here and uh, harass his loose bishop um, is one idea. I was thinking I would probably just take and if he takes um, well, the engine gives queen takes d4. I didn't think of this line. I was thinking, let's back up a second after I take, if he takes this way, I could, thought I could take over here. Maybe this doesn't work. Oh, well, because this uh, my knight is loose in this in this line. Okay, maybe I was thinking of a different point. Um, so, yeah. So in this position, yeah, probably knight a4 is the move that. Uh, <laughs> you know, let's cancel that. If he pushes, I'll play knight a4, hitting his bishop, and uh, let's let's check that out. So he pushes. I play knight a4. I didn't work this part out in the game. Um, so he needs to retreat the bishop. Say he wants to stay. Oh, that's the problem. It chases him off this diagonal. So if his bishop drops back this way, um, then I can just pick up the pawn. And also if he exchanges this knight, um, my bishop comes to this diagonal again looking at his knight and there's an opportunity for me to exchange the bishop against knight here and uh, create another isolated pawn 
for black. So uh, I have enough going on that it's not advisable for him to push the pawn here. And he plays a, a sensible developing move, rook c8. And now I play uh, bishop b2. Once again, <laughs> before I play this, I have to calculate uh, this move uh, e5. I guess I won't keep doing that. He plays uh, rook e8 here, developing. And I play rook c1. So the engine still rates this position as about even. So um, neither side really has uh, <clears throat> a strong advantage, but it's not the kind of even position which is drawish. It's it's more double-edged than that because uh, there's different different kinds of advantages that each side has. Um, I have the more solid position. Uh, black has the more space and the more active pieces, and uh, so something eventually will give way. My opponent plays a6 to uh, try and uh, keep my knight out of the b5 square. And actually, um, I had planned before this move to play, play, if he played a6, to play my knight to b5 anyway, taking advantage of the discovered attack on his bishop. And only when we got to this position did I realize that um, he, can, he can do a kamikaze move. He can sacrifice his bishop on, uh, on e3 here. So this move is no longer any good. I, I play my knight here, and the rook is attacking his bishop. Instead of taking my knight, though, he takes on e3. And, uh, yeah, I take back, and then he can grab the knight. And um, this is decent. He can uh, take here. <clears throat> bishop takes f6. Oh, I guess it's my move. Yeah, I can take on f6 and try and uh, mess up some things over here. But uh, basically, black is doing fine in this position. So um, I didn't want to play that way and end up playing the move knight a4. But um, there's actually a different tactic here, which I... Uh, this is really the first tactic I missed in the game. But um, there's a good move for white in this position if you want to uh, look for it. Okay, I'm going to give the answer away. The answer is uh, knight takes the d pawn. I can just get rid of that. Uh, I can just get rid of that uh, isolated d pawn that I've been playing against, and uh, and just have a good position here, uh -huh. because he's got to do something about the attack on his uh, bishop. So very simple uh, way to gain an advantage here, and um, it's hard to say why I didn't think of that. You know, whenever you have a tactic like a discovery, you should really look around for all possible discoveries and, and find the best one. See if there's one that, that really gives you an advantage. And instead, you know, I had this kind of tunnel vision. I'd been thinking in advance of these various knight moves, knight to b5, knight to a4, and I just was calculating those moves and I did not even stop to consider this move. Knight takes uh, d5, the best move in the position. I didn't even think about it. <laughs> So, but that's what happens, uh, you know, if, if you can uh, use certain things as a cue. I mean, ideally, you would like to be able to think about all the captures every move. And if you can do that, uh, you'll probably help your game immensely. Uh, but if you have trouble uh, thinking about that at every move, at least uh, in cases where there's obvious tactical uh, motifs like that, uh, yeah, let's erase a few of those arrows. There's an obvious tactical motif here with the discovered attack, and so whenever one of those appears on the board, uh, you should always pause at that point, if you have time, of course, depending on the length of the game and your, your time situation. Always pause to stop and consider all of the uh, ways to take advantage of that tactic. Um, okay, you can use that as a cue. Anyway, I played knight a4, hitting his bishop. And, um, hang on just a second... He played bishop e7, just retreating. I had expected something different. I thought he would uh, retreat his bishop to the square um, a7 so as to maintain pressure on this diagonal. And so I was imagining a continuation like that, like this. Bishop a7, and then knight here, um, blocking the bishop, and once again um, preventing him from pushing his pawn forward. And... Um, yeah, the engine says queen e7 is a pretty good move here. Also knight e4. So black is is doing fine in this position. Um, but what he played was bishop back to e7. And I think uh, this is not as accurate and allows me to play the move knight d4. So finally, you know, I've avoided occupying the square in front of the pawn 
But finally, I thought this would be the time because what this does is it forces some exchanges. And it's in my interest to exchange all the pieces. Like I say, I want to uh, get an end game position basically where I'm playing against this isolated queen's pawn. And so the more exchanges I can engineer, um, the better off I am. But I don't want exchanges at any cost. I want exchanges that uh, don't harm my position. So uh, my opponent took here and uh, took back with the queen. Let's see. Um, he could have considered taking on d4. And yeah, this is the position I was thinking of. So if he takes here, I was thinking I grab the bishop here, and that also hits his rook. And uh, he can throw in rook takes c1, escape that way. Bishop takes, and now um, he needs to retreat the knight, knight back to e6. I guess he's got a good square for the uh, knight. So this is... Um, one of the ways I was thinking the game might have proceeded at this point. And uh, it helps me, but uh, you know, the engine still rates this as even. Uh, I guess this is a good formation for Black's pieces. Kind of an interesting one. Um, but he took the other way. He took on e2. It's also an okay move. I take back. And then he played bishop to d6. Maybe thinking of setting up some threats along this diagonal. And uh, right here... Um, this is something I didn't think about too much. The engine is recommending... I did think about this during the game. I just didn't like it. But the engine is recommending knight takes c6, pawn takes c6, and then taking over here on f6. Um, and, you know, it does uh, meet my goal of getting rid of uh, a lot of material. Ah, here's what I missed. I can now grab the uh, pawn on a6. Okay. So that's that's what I missed during the game. So this exchange after um, bishop d6. Take here. <clears throat> if he takes with a rook, I can trade rooks and still bring this uh, b pawn to c6. And then his a pawn is loose. So missed that tactic. <laughs> uh, so that would have been a good way to play. I just uh, got my queen out of this uh, potential pin. Um, the... Uh, my my rook my knight was a bit loose there. It was defended by the bishop, but because of the pin on the pawn there, it wasn't defended by a pawn, and so there were it was, it was in a little bit of danger. Okay, so still about an even position according to the chess engine evaluation. Now my opponent takes here, and I was happy to see this. It's my knight out, my bishop out, and it trades off another pair of pieces, and now I'm threatening to uh, cause some damage over here. If I were allowed to, I would take the knight. And if he takes with a queen, I would take the queens off and leave him with these uh, doubled pawns on the f-file, the isolated pawn here, and just play that endgame uh, very happily. So um, my opponent doesn't want that, though, and he stops the pawn damage by playing uh, bishop to e5, which is the best move in the position here. And uh, I thought about this position for a long time. I was not sure um, if I could find a good square for my bishop, I would... Uh, I would move it away because I, I think this is a good piece, but um, just uh, I, I couldn't find a particularly good square. And I thought, uh, well, pulling his rook here, maybe I get some tactics against it. So I had the idea of playing my knight here and then here, hitting his rook. The knight to here, I, I went ahead and played this. Um, it hits a pawn, so I can play this with tempo. But he drops the rook back to e7, so I haven't gamed that much. I was thinking I could come here. But uh, this served an important uh, uh, function for me. Um, that trade helped activate my knight, which was sitting over on the side of the board. So once again, you know, it's important to keep all your pieces in the game, not let any of them get sidelined uh, indefinitely. So um, after this move, um, the knight d3 idea no longer seemed attractive. It's not coming with tempo. And I, once again, I have to worry about him pushing the pawn forward. I'm not uh, blockading it. So I play rook f to d1. And my opponent plays queen to e8. I think maybe at this point he was getting a little bit impatient. Um, <clears throat> you know, he's been playing. It's It's been a long game. We've both been thinking about our moves a, a lot. And there's been this constant pressure on the d-pawn. And uh, he's just trying to start to look for counterplay. Um, but I don't think there's a whole lot going on on this uh, uh, file at this point. If he pushes and I take, he still can't uh, checkmate me. But there is, uh, you have to recognize, there is a back row weakness for both sides and that our kings don't have any uh, escape. So if I were to uh, uh, lift one of my rooks, 
There's a checkmate thread on the back rank, for example. So after queen e8, I continue with my plan to improve the knight. Knight to d3, thinking it might come to f4, attacking this pawn. And once again, I have to calculate that uh, e5 is not a valid tactic at this point. Or d4. d5 to d4 is not a valid tactic. Um, but my opponent plays rook e to c7. So he's um, starting to move away from just being purely defensive and trying to get active. But I think, so this move is a slight mistake. Let's see if we back up a move or two. Is this, uh, well, starting with queen e8 is uh, where I first start to get a significant advantage in the computer evaluation. So it's just, I mean, it's not a huge advantage, but it's the first time I've had a slight edge in this game uh, as opposed to being in the range of about even. So I trade, it takes, and then I play knight f4. So this was my idea. I've activated my knight. It's it's attacking his d pawn, and uh, but I have at this point uh, finally given my opponent an opportunity for some counterplay, perhaps, perhaps, and he continues with the move rook c2. So uh, here, this this is apparently a mistake. Um, but there were a couple of variations. What I was expecting here was queen e8. And um, I thought I couldn't take the pawn, so let's go through the variation as I imagined it. If I take the pawn, he takes, and I take with my rook, hitting his queen. He can check. The king has no escape squares. I bring my rook back, and I had noticed my rook has defended my, my queen, but he can just take the rook, drawing my queen here, and then take my queen, and that's checkmate. So I thought... Um, I thought just queen to um, uh, d8 here, defending the pawn, was going to be sufficient to hold it because uh, he's got two defenders on it and he's got the threat of the back rank mate to prevent me from taking it. But uh, when I looked at this with a chess engine, it turns out I can take it because after knight takes, I can play the move e4 to get my knight back. And uh, he can't prevent me from taking the knight now. The knight is pinned. And if it moves, uh, not only do I win the queen, but I checkmate him. <laughs> so, so that knight's not going anywhere. Um, the best he can do is move his queen out of the way. Oh, the engine is recommending queen d6. But wherever he puts the queen, I'm going to take that and be a pawn up. So I could have, uh, if he had played the move queen d8, which I thought was his best defense here, um, then I could have taken the pawn anyway. I don't know if I would have seen that in the game because... In this position, as I was trying to imagine what my opponent was going to do and what I would respond, um, I thought queen d8 was an adequate defense. The uh, engine recommends queen to c6 as a defense, or queen to e5, trying to trade things off. Okay, so rook c2 is an attempt to get active, and at first I thought this was pretty good. Uh, sometimes it's an idea just to give up this uh, d-pawn to activate your pieces. Um, but after I thought about it a little more, I realized I could just take that pawn, and uh, he's going to try and recover his pawn with the move knight to e4. And um, this is awkward to defend. My queen is defending it. I don't want to play a passive move like, um, <clears throat> like rook to f1. But as I thought about this position some more, I realized I don't even need to uh, defend that pawn. And if you want to pause the video and think about it, um, that this might be a good point. There's one uh, really strong move that the uh, chess engine points out here, which is actually winning for white after knight e4. And that's maybe hard to see. So there's, there's two puzzles in this position. One is, that, can you find the best move for white, which I didn't play? And then the second puzzle is, can you find out why, uh, why I don't have to worry about... Uh, uh, the loss of this pawn. Actually, that's a little too vague. Um, I'm going to show you the answer uh, for the first question, which is what's the best move um, the computer found in this position? Um, and that is knight e7 check. <laughs> Not a move you'd think of, right? You're just placing the knight there where it could be taken. But of course, uh, if he takes it, there's big trouble. You take the knight, and now he can't take the queen because of checkmate. 
So the queen has to drop back to defend the back rank. And then uh, queen c2, and you're penetrating your two pawns up now, and you're just, uh, you have a devastating threat on, uh, on the, the back rank here. Is there a better move than that? Queen takes, oh, I'm taking c2. Queen takes the rook. <laughs> I was gonna say uh, that wasn't that wasn't the way I remembered it. Okay. Yeah. So knight e7 check. He takes. You take. So the material's even. He can't take the queen. But you have two threats. You know, the threat is to take the queen and checkmate him, and the threat is to take the rook. If he plays the rook back, then he loses the queen. Yeah. So the queen goes back, and then you grab the rook. So anyway, uh, that I did not see that tactic. I saw some of the ideas though. And so that'll give you a clue as to what's going on. And uh, so the move I played is the second best move in the position, but um, still has some interesting uh, points to it. And it's still winning for white, basically. So now black only has one defense in this position. He can't afford... This is, a, this is the uh, position I meant to ask about. He can't afford to take the pawn with his uh, rook. I'm attacking the rook, sort of encouraging him to take that pawn. Um, so if you want to pause the video and see why uh, why can't um, black take that pawn, that's your that's your tactics quiz and the final tactics quiz for this uh, video. Okay, that's what happened. Is he took the pawn, and then I just took the knight, and he resigned. His his rook is hanging, his queen is hanging, and if he takes my queen. I checkmate him, so there's really uh, no way out here. Um, just game over. His best defense in this position after knight b4, in fact, his only move to hold the game at all is to place the uh, rook back here, defending his back rank. But now I've just grabbed the d-pawn. I'm a pawn up, and I can look forward to a comfortable game. You know, I'll probably play a simple move like uh, g3 here to give my king a little space. I don't have to worry about these back rank threats and then just uh, continue from here. Um, I think I won't have any trouble chasing his knight away. So uh, uh, so I should go on to win this game anyway, but the, the way it was played was kind of nice. For me, anyway. <laughs> he played rook takes f2, and I played queen takes e4, and then my opponent resigned in this position. That's how the game ended. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. I think... Uh, you know, it's interesting to look at these kind of positional games. It may seem like there was just one simple theme running through the whole game, but each time you had to uh, look at all these tactics. Um, so that's it. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Leave any comments you have in the section below, and I will see you again soon. Bye.